Yeah, so it's a great pleasure to have uh, Professor Brian Schwingel from Department of Physics, uh, University of uh, Maryland. Uh, he's uh, uh, in the condensed matter theory group. Uh, apart from that, Brian is also Simon's fellow and also associated with the computing center of that uh, institute. He did his PhD from MIT on 2011, and his area of interest lying within quantum information theory, many body system, and quantum gravity. Uh, particularly, uh, he, is, uh, he had done a lot of work on out of equilibrium physics, particularly I have to say OTOCs. Yeah, and uh, uh, its connection to black holes and a lot of things. So uh, please, Brian, uh, you can start. And uh, uh, it's uh, basically our 26th uh, uh, talk in the series. And we are very happy to have you. And uh, thank you for giving your time. Uh, you can start from your end. Great, thanks um, very much uh, for that kind introduction and, and for the invitation. Uh, very happy to be here. It's always nice to see um, new faces and meet new people. And um, so I'm excited to, to talk to you today. As, as was said, please ask questions at any point if you have them. Um, and yeah, let's get started. So what I wanna tell you about is um, kind of a new topic for me. Um, which we've been investigating for a little bit now. It's a topic that has seen a lot of attention in the quantum information community, but not so much in the many body physics community. But I think that that uh, should probably change and I'll try to convince you of that today. Um, the specific thing I'll talk about is called magic. I'll explain what that is. And what I'll try to convince you is that um, conformal field theories, or at least lattice models of conformal field theories are very magical. And I'll explain what that means as I go through the talk. Um, but essentially that they are, um, well, anyways, I'll explain it. Uh, this, is, this is joint work with two postdocs at the University of Maryland, Christopher White and Charles Gao. Um, and you can read about it now in this archive paper where I put the number here. And I'll just also thank um, the various funders at the bottom there for supporting aspects of this work. Um, yeah, so let's get started. I want to proceed um, by sort of giving you a broad picture, first of all. And I'm going to talk first, try to motivate the talk in terms of thinking about complexity in many body physics. Then I'll precisely define magic and mana. And then I'll introduce a model, the POTS model, um, one dimensional quantum spin chain which is the model that we'll do our concrete calculations in. And I'll explain to you both what we calculate and what we find, and also how to give a nice tensor network picture for the resulting physics. And then at the end, I'll give a kind of discussion of what I think of the possible broader implications of this subject in, in many body physics, and possibly even quantum gravity. So the basic idea is there's going to be a quantity called mana that we're going to calculate. Um, this is a measure of how a state differs from being what's called a stabilizer state. I'll explain what those things are shortly. But the point will be that there's a precise model, the pot model. We can calculate that mana as a function of the phase diagram. And what you'll find is shown in this little picture here. This is just a preview of what's coming. I plot the mana density on the y-axis and the phase diagram control parameter on the x-axis. And uh, in two limits where the ground state is very simple, the mana of the ground state turns out to be zero. But right at the critical point, which is this gray dashed line here in the center, the mana is maximum. And uh, because at this gray dashed line, the low energy physics is described by conformal field theory, the POTS conformal field theory, three state POTS conformal field theory, and because, as I'll argue, the mana persists to all scales, we conclude that the conformal field theory itself is in some sense magical. Okay. So the talk will be about explaining these terms and explaining this picture and convincing you that the claim I just made is true. 
Okay, but let me step back first and talk about complexity. So why are we thinking about this subject of magic? Well, it, it has a lot to do with thinking about the role of complexity in many body physics and gravity. Um, for many of us in the quantum gravity ADS CFT community, complexity came into our thoughts via thinking about the growth of wormholes. So I'll be very schematic here because I don't want to introduce too much background on ADS CFT, but the rough picture is that you have two holographic conformal field theories. They're in an entangled state. And this so-called Penrose diagram here on the left top indicates that entangled state. It's a black hole or really a pair of black holes that are entangled. The left black line is the left conformal field theory. The right black line is the right conformal field theory. We've suppressed space. So we're just showing time in the emergent holographic radial direction. And this green straight line in the middle of the diagram is the initial wormhole, which connects these two entangled states. So this wormhole represents the entanglement between the two sides. And if I were to draw a space, say if the CFTs, the conformal field theory lives on a circle, then that wormhole, a slice through the spatial part of it would look like a sort of cylinder that's kind of fat at the edges and then gets thin. This blue line here is the horizon. And that's a nice simple picture which captures the entanglement between the two sides in this thermal field double state. Um, but what happens interestingly is that if you let the system evolve in time, so if you move time forward for this conformal field theories, then what you find is that um, in a sense, this wormhole between them is growing in length. And this growing length persists for as long as you care to look, well after say correlation functions have saturated to the equilibrium value, well after two point functions have decayed to zero or approximately zero, well after entropies have saturated. So the system looks totally scrambled, thermalized, equilibrated on any scale for any simple probe, but still this wormhole is growing linearly with time. And the suggestion uh, based on various tensor network models and other intuitions was that what's growing here is the complexity of the quantum state. And that's not a concept that's super familiar to most of us in physics, but it's really an idea borrowed from computer science and quantum information, which is saying that you have some, say, state, you have a reference state, which you regard as simple, and you have a set of elementary operations you can apply to that reference state. The complexity is just the minimum number of those elementary operations you need to apply to produce the thing you care about, the target, from the reference. Maybe with some precision, et cetera. There's lots of little choices you can make in the definition. But the basic idea is that the number of simple things you need to do to make something. And so what's saying here is that this quantum state, even after it looks totally equilibrated, is still becoming more complex, meaning you need to do more operations to prepare it um, as time evolves. And that's sort of pretty reasonable. You keep applying the Hamiltonian evolution over and over and over again. So it's just moving around in Hilbert space and becoming more and more complicated to produce. Now I mentioned tensor networks. Um, one of my own contributions to the subject was to propose this idea that we can think about the emergence of geometry in ADS CFT in terms of tensor networks, at least as a toy model. So here I'm showing say the ground state ADS in the spatial section and you think of these blue dots on the edge as the place where the conformal field theory lives. It's a sort of a discretized setting here, but it's a schematic so let's not worry about it. We have this sort of UV short distance microscopic CFT at the outer most layer. And then as we go in, we sort of renormalizing in some sense the CFT wave function. We're looking at longer and longer scales. And this RG history or RG trajectory as encapsulated in the network that encodes the renormalization sort of is the emergent space. Right? And from this point of view, and as I already mentioned, this was one of the motivations for the complexity proposal um, on the previous slide, which I guess was first pointed out by Lenny Suskind, um, is that from this tensor network point of view, it's quite reasonable to see how this works. You sort of have in this growing wormhole three pieces. You have a left part, which corresponds to the renormalization group flow from the UV down to the thermal scale, the scale of temperature where your dynamics is happening. On the right, you have the same kind of renormalization from the UV of the right down to the thermal scale. 
at the thermal scale, the CFTs are entangled. And that entanglement is represented by some connection here, this wormhole between the two or this orange region of this network down here at the bottom. And as time evolves, you're just laying on more and more gates into the orange region. So it just gets longer and longer and longer in, in a way which is linear with time. And these gates here are like the elementary operations that we're applying to produce um, this extended state from a simpler reference state. This picture of the tensor network was first drawn by Hartman Maldacena. Um, and then in one of our papers on holographic complexity, we sort of made this connection explicit and gave a precise argument in terms of these RG tensor networks that what you would get, what we would expect here is to lay down a number of gates, which is proportional to the entropy and to the temperature. So the entropy is like how many degrees of freedom are active and the temperature is like the rate of computation or the rate of application of gates. Okay. Now, the problem with this story is that, as I've told it here, it doesn't seemingly really distinguish between, say, a, a chaotic Ising model, something that we'd be familiar with in a like many body physics context, something we regard as a, sort of a simple minimal model of uh, the physics of some, say, magnetic material, and a holographic CFT. You know, they both have they both can have an RG structure, like they, they can both have quantum critical points or conformal field theories to describe their infrared physics. They can both have growing complexity because they can both have chaos. So as sketched here, this diagram is not really telling the difference between CFTs that are holographic and CFTs that are not holographic, or at least not holographic in a, in a simple way. So what this suggested to me is that we need to and this is a problem we've known about for a while, that these tensor networks are sort of a little bit too schematic. I mean, they're probably right, but the difference between different situations is described by looking at within the tensors themselves. So you need to kind of look inside these little blue blobs and figure out what the structure of the individual tensors are in order to distinguish, say, a holographic CFT from the Ising CFT. Okay, so how do we do that? We don't really know what the right way to think about this. I mean, you, of course, you can look at the tensors, you can do numerics for some concrete model, or you can try to make toy models, you can do various things. But so far, I think we don't have a good understanding of how to characterize the difference between, you know, say the Ising conformal field theory and a holographic conformal field theory in terms of these tensors. But uh, the magic and manner that I'll talk about in this talk is sort of one attempt to make some sense of this. And, um, because that time dependent scenario is sort of more complicated, what I want to do for the rest of the talk is just focus on the ground state. Because the question also arises there, and it's in simpler, simpler setting. Just in the ground state of your favorite mini body model, if it has a critical point, if it's described at long wavelengths and low energy by a conformal field theory, you would expect something like this kind of RG network that I pictured here to be valid where essentially we have, again, in the, in the, at the top here, at the ultraviolet, at the short distance, some microscopic Hamiltonian. And as we renormalize the state, which is indicated by these blue layers, we can disentangle some degrees of freedom, which then factorize out, that's these zeros. And what we're left with is, is some renormalized state on half as many degrees of freedom, say. The fact that I went from, from you know, say L sites to L over two sites is not really important. That's like a, just a choice of scheme. So let me just choose that. Um, and then I can just repeat this procedure. I can now renormalize again at this first coarse grain scale, factor out additional degrees of freedom and produce an even more normalized wave function. And this kind of structure, we have good evidence, both numerical and analytical in a variety of contexts can capture a wide variety of phases of matter, of lattice models. Anytime there's some kind of critical behavior in the infrared, which you can think about as being a conformal field theory or some kind of scale invariant field theory, um, we think this is a good picture of the physics of that quantum state. So that's nice, that generality is encouraging. It means we have a good general tool, but still the question persists, how do we tell these different theories apart from the point of view of what's in these individual tensors? So that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about 
mana and magic as a way to start distinguishing some of these different features. Okay, so let me explain so, uh, now. Uh, um, I have one yeah. question. Please. So uh, in the previous uh, circuit that you have shown, so each of the operation is unitary there, probably. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, this is basically representing some uh, uh, many body wave function through uh, tensor network. You want to write that? That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, so maybe a comment here is that tensor networks as a broader tool, you don't have to have the tensors be unitary and they can still be a representation of the wave function. Okay. okay. It may not be easy to compute either classically or on a quantum computer or any other way, like what the properties of that wave function are, but you can definitely represent it that way if you wanna, if you, you can think about representing it that way. Um, but yeah, here I'm taking them to be unitary which both um, helps with the classical calculation. Like if you want to numerically study your model using this method, this helps. And also means that you can think about this as a real quantum circuit that you could actually implement on some sort of controlled quantum device. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And just to be explicit, the, the MERA I mentioned before, that's what this structure is. It's called the multi-scale impingement renormalization ansatz, originally due to Guy Vidal. And then my collaborators and I have spent a lot of time sort of generalizing this structure and proving that it works for a variety of different, or give, at least giving evidence that it works for a variety of different uh, situations. Okay. Can, can I also ask you a question? Please. What does this line that terminate as zero mean? Um, you can think of it e either viewing the diagram going up or going down. So let's say going from the bottom up, it's like you start with a bunch of zeros Yes, then you fine. successively entangle them and then you introduce more zeros and entangle them and more zeros and entangle them. So it's just a circuit that tells you how to go from all zeros to a particular quantum state. Yes. Or if you're going down, you can think of it as you take some state, you apply some gates to it, and then you project onto the zeros. It's like integrating out some degrees of freedom? Yeah, roughly speaking. Sorry, I also have a related question. Are Please. all the blue boxes the same unitary here or are you, you in? Um, they don't have to be. In, in practice, what you'll find is that near the UV, the first couple of layers will depend on the microscopics. And then if you have some kind of fixed point or something that emerges, the lower down layers will eventually sort of become the same and repeat. Of course, even within a single RG layer, they say the first row and second row can be different. But typically, you find, yeah, that they're kind of like the same everywhere after a while. Thank you. So, I have a question. As a, as a quantum circuit, uh, which gates do you choose? Or how do you know which gates to choose? Or are all the gates uh, basically chosen randomly? Uh, good question. They're, they're not chosen randomly. You can view this, but probably the simplest way to think about this is as a variational onsets. Mm -hmm. So you view this as a quantum state where you have a bunch of parameters, the parameters being the angles that control which, what the unitaries are. Mm -hmm. And then you just vary those angles as a, you know, you, you, you look at, you pick a Hamiltonian, you study the energy that Hamiltonian is a function of all those angles, and you choose the angles that minimize the energy. I see. Okay. So, uh, and each angle then determines a quantum gate. That's right. They're basically yeah. determined by the Hamiltonian of the theory. That's right. So, you know, like just to be completely explicit, like what, what, you know, you, what you might do is you have, say, suppose each of these lines are qubits, you have like Ising Hamiltonian up here, and each of these gates is just a uh, four by four unitary matrix. Mm -hmm. so, um, okay, so they're acting on two qubits in particular. That's right, they're acting on two qubits. And so you just have a bunch, you know, each of these has like 15 parameters if I ignore the overall phase. So you have 15 parameters times the number of boxes. And you mm -hmm. just sweep through, say, the simplest way to do this is to sweep through a bunch of times and optimize each one individually to try to lower the energy. And you just do this a bunch of times until the energy has stopped changing. And that's, you know, a variational approximation to your, to your ground state. I see. Uh, will you show a particular uh, quantum circuit for some Hamiltonian uh, later on? Um, I will show a Hamiltonian. I won't show a, a, I won't show a quantum circuit where I specify in detail um which quantum gates are coming up or yeah, which, which quantum gates are coming okay. probably the, the simplest example i have a paper with 
um, Michael Walter, um, who also on that paper, well, a lot of people on that paper, Volker Schultz, others, where we show how for non-interacting fermions, you can mm -hmm. choose these circuits. You don't, you don't even do it variationally. You can just figure out what they're supposed to be because the problem is solvable. Mm -hmm. And then they are form elements of a wavelet transform. So you may have heard of wavelets as like this thing which kind of does like sort of like a Fourier transform, but with a, in a windowed way. So it kind of mixes space and momentum space. Mm -hmm. And then you can figure out that these gates can be elements of a wavelet transform, which you can write down explicitly. And then they're just rotating basically between different fermion modes. So there are totally explicit constructions mm -hmm. and you can also do them numerically. Um, yeah, and I think that's, that's all I can say at this point. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Right, excuse me. Uh, what, what, what is the main um, goal of this <clears throat> particular <clears throat> tensor network architecture? Are you trying to uh, make sure that the entanglement grows with, in a particular way or, or some other simple property like that? Yeah, this, this architecture is designed to be able to capture the entanglement structure and correlation structure of a scale invariant lattice model or a lattice model that flows to a scale invariant fixed point. Right, but we, we do not know, if, uh, I'm just asking, we do not know if that's a, a unique architecture, right? There could be other possible tensor networks which achieve the same, right? Uh, for sure. So, um, so certainly this particular architecture in terms of the two to one structure is not unique. You can have more layers. Um, there are also other kinds of networks where the tensors are not unitary, but you don't have the extra like RG interpretation layers but which can nevertheless still approximately capture scale invariant phenomena. So it's not unique by any means. Thanks. So I just, in terms of quantum computation, there is a, well, there would be a quantum circuit with minimal number of gates, which would achieve this. Yeah. That's not the one you want. It's a, I mean, that, but I guess you don't know what the end state is going to be. That's completely random. You're uh, um, uh, well, I, I wouldn't say it's completely random. I, I'll distinguish again two situations. We can have a tensor network for, which represents a state that we're using for classical calculation, like for numerics. Mm -hmm. And then the tensors don't have to be in unitary, so they don't have to be interpretable as quantum gates. Uh, okay. And, and then, you know, so for example, you can have a, just a planar network. Like it, there's a 2D version of this, a, a sort of two plus the RG direction version. And then a, another 2D tensor network called a PEPS, protected entangled pair state. And we don't know for sure, but it seems like there's evidence that PEPS can capture the same rough class of states that, or can capture a similar class of states to what the Mara can capture here. Even though it doesn't have all the extra layers, but the tensors there are not unitary. So you can't think of it as a quantum circuit. Okay. Okay. So this is probably, I would say a good guess is that this is a, a approximately minimal architecture where you require the tensors to be unitary for a scale invariant quantum system. Mm -hmm. So Brian, I, sh I would request you to please uh, uh, go through because we have time restrictions as well. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. All right. Um, sorry. So, uh, so magic, why are we going to think about magic? Well, there's various reasons. Some of them come from quantum information. Uh, for example, if you want to ultimately have a fault tolerant quantum computer, you need some kind of fault tolerant computational scheme. And there are restrictions just from the structure of quantum mechanics on those schemes. Um, in particular, there's a special class of gates called Clifford gates that are often easy. I'll define those in a moment. And the states that are made from Clifford operations are called stabilizers. So those are the easy states to make. And magic is just characterizing your ability to go beyond stabilizer states. So there are many fault tolerant schemes where the Clifford gates and the stabilizer states are easy to implement. Going outside of that class is hard or requires more effort. And so you might want to characterize how far away the thing you want to do is from that simple class. So this is viewing magic as a resource that characterizes how many hard things you need to do in your computational scheme. 
Another motivation comes from ADS-CFT, where stabilizer states form a kind of common reference point for thinking about the entanglement structure. You want a sort of simple toy model of entanglement, and stabilizers can give you that. And so here again, because magic is sort of giving you information about how stabilizer-like a state is, if we can say something about the magic or some analog of magic in ADS-CFT, we can say something about how good of a cartoon structure these stabilizer states provide. But more interestingly, I think um, for me, it's just that magic is sort of new and it seems interesting. I don't know exactly what all it's gonna be good for yet. I'll try to convince you it gives some interesting new points of view on a variety of interesting phenomena. But we're just in the early days of this story, I think. So um, to me, it just seems interesting and that's why I'm thinking about it. So let's get into the details. So the idea here is you have a Q state system. Your system is composed of a tensor product of lots of Q state things. Here, omega is the Q root of unity. And we have generalization of the poly operators, which are the clock, Z, and shift operators, X. And the idea is that Z just tells you which root of unity, which Q root of unity you're at, and X shifts you between different roots of unity. So Z and X are like the generalizations of poly Z and poly X to a general Q level system. And I can define um, the general so-called vial operators in terms of these products of Z's and X's. So if this were Q equals two, then the thing you'd get here would be a, a Y. But when Q is bigger than two, then you get a whole set of operators here. And the Clifford group is just the group that maps every string of these poly, generalized poly matrices to themselves. So for a single Q trit, say, Q equals three, you would just have a group generated by this matrix K and this matrix H, which are um, like kind of like a phase rotation and something like a Hadamard transformation, which flips you from, from the Z basis to the X basis. If you have multiple Q trits, then you can get gates that can generate entanglement. So here S is what's called a controlled sum gate. Basically it takes in two states I and J and outputs I and then I plus J where the plus means mod three say in this case. Okay, so this is the structure. Um, if you think of Z as like the exponential of position and X is like the exponential of momentum, it's like a kind of discrete position and momentum space. And then stabilizers are like the analogs of Gaussian states. And Clifford's are like the analogs of Gaussian operations, that is operations that preserve the Gaussianity. Okay, and um, from this point of view, the say a, a simple choice for the quote unquote difficult or non-Clifford gate is something called a T gate, where I do a rotation, a phase rotation by an angle that's not a multiple of omega. So here this C is two pi i over nine for the Q trip case. And this is just an example. You can define the structure for any Q. It's nicest when Q is prime, it has the best properties, and even nicer when Q is an odd prime. Um, the reason being that this two inverse only exists in the field as a, I mean, only exists as a integer in zero to Q minus one when Q is odd prime, or at least that's the, that's when it's prime. So that's a convenient thing to have. And so what I'll tell you about mana and magic, well, magic is a general notion, but mana really requires us to have an odd prime Hilbert space. And that's what we'll do. We'll consider the case of Q equals three, which is the simplest odd prime. So here's the idea. Stabilizer set is just arbitrary mixtures of pure stabilizer states. So I define stabilizer states before. That's anything which can be produced starting from say all zeros with Clifford operations, and I allow coin flips. So you can flip a classical coin and produce a probabilistic mixture of these stabilizer states. And that's called the space stab. It's like a, some subset of all possible many body states. And then magic states plus Clifford gates can give you arbitrary gates. So you can generate anything as long as you have some states that are outside of this stabilizer set with a certain nice property. And so any measure, which is not increasing under Clifford operations is called a magic monotone. So it just measures how much non-Cliffordness, how far beyond Clifford stabilizer you are. Uh, a, a conceptually simple example is 
the relative entropy of magic. So the idea is you have a state row. You just minimize over all states in the stabilizer set the relative entropy between rho and sigma. So if this is zero, then that means rho is in the stabilizer set. And if it's non-zero, it's not. And then its magnitude will tell you something about how far away from the stabilizer set um, rho is. This is hard to calculate though, so we're gonna take something simpler. And that something simpler is called uh, mana, which is essentially just a kind of log negativity. If you thought about negativity and entanglement, it's a little bit related to that. As I said, if this is the nicest for odd prime Q, we'll take Q equals three, but you can do other things. And the idea here is you have what's called a discrete Hudson theorem. Again, this is sort of a callback to Gaussian quantum optics. Um, where you have photons in Gaussian states, then there's something called Hudson's theorem, which says that a pure Gaussian state, I mean, a state is pure, if, if a pure state is Gaussian if and only if its Wigner function is non negative. The Wigner function is like this attempt to define a phase space distribution for momentum and position simultaneously. So here there's an analog of that called discrete Hudson theorem due to Gross, which says that a state, if it's pure, is only a stabilizer state if its Wigner function is non-negative. And that Wigner function is defined schematically like this. You have these T sub Bs, which are the poly strings I showed you before. And you can define what are called phase space point operators, these A sub Bs, where you just take the sum over all the poly strings as a kind of reference point, and then you apply, you conjugate that with these pairs of poly strings. So these operators, I don't have time to explain this in detail, but these operators sort of have a, can be thought of as like living at points in a discrete phase space. And so then you can expand your density matrix in terms of this basis of operators and the coefficients there are called the discrete Wigner function. They always sum up to one. And so if you sum up them in absolute value, then that tells you how many, it quantifies something about how many entries of this Wigner function are negative. So if Wigner function is entirely positive, then because it sums to one, it means the sum of the absolute values is also one, the log of that is zero. And so the mana, which is again, the log negativity would just be zero. So mana is zero for a stabilizer or for any positive Wigner function. But if you have a non-stabilizer state and the Wigner function is negative, then the mana can detect that. You have to be a little careful here because this Hudson theorem only applies for pure states. So you can have mixed non-stabilizer states, but which nevertheless have positive Wigner function. So this mana is only like an upper bound. And this was all first talked about in this very nice paper by Veach, Mosabi, and Gottesman, and Emerson, which formed one of the important backgrounds for our work. So as I said, two is sort of hard actually. So we do the simplest, next simplest case, which is three. And we're gonna study the three state POTS model. This model is defined as follows. You have a 1D spin chain where each site has three levels. You have, again, your clock and shift operators. And the Hamiltonian just has two terms. It has a term which prefers the spins to align on the Z basis. That's this Z dagger Z term. It wants neighboring spins to align. And then there's another term which um, wants the spins to be simple in the X basis. And these two terms don't commute, so, so they compete. And the physics determine by which of them is dominant. So in a limit where the first term is dominant, you have an all Z state. In the limit where the second one is dominant, you have an all X state. Both of those are stabilizer. So you expect the mana to be zero at either extreme limit where one or the other terms dominates. The critical point actually occurs where these two terms sort of maximally compete with each other. And so it's not unreasonable to think that the magic is going to be largest at the critical point. And that's indeed what we're gonna find as I, as I showed you in that preview. So here's the phase diagram as a function of the angle theta, which controls the relative strength of these two terms. You see, as I said, when theta is zero or pi by two, um, then the mana is zero. And when theta is pi by four, which is the exact location of the critical point, then the mana is actually maximal. What I'm showing here is actually the mana density. That's the mana divided by the system size. Uh, so we find the mana is extensive to leading order. And um, what I'm showing these different curves are different subsystems. So we can't actually compute the mana of the whole system. That's sort of computationally too hard for us right now. We're working on getting around that. But what we can do is compute the mana of subsystems. And so here are the different curves 
going from light yellow to dark red correspond to subsystems of size one, two, three, four, up to seven. And you see that the mana keeps going up, the mana density keeps going up, and it's always peaking like near or right at the critical point. This black n equals six line is just the exact answer for a six site chain. Here we have 128 sites, and we're looking at these subregions of the whole system. And I think the fact that the mana density keeps going up as you increase the subsystem size is indicating that the mana is not just coming from like local states that are in between X and Z. There's really some non-locality inherent in the, in the mana, which, which we want to try to bring out. Okay, so here we can study. Excuse me, yeah. ask, what was lambda on the previous slide? Oh, this is a small field, a small Z field that we use to um, break the degeneracy of the ground space. When, there is an, another term in the Hamiltonian which is not written on the slide. That's right, yeah. It's a, it's just lambda z, z plus z dagger. Uh, may, may I ask, uh, anticipating uh, taking continuous limit and going to CFT, uh, those notions like mana and stabilizer states, uh, they depend on the choice of gates, right? Uh, can you define them uh, like with without actually mentioning particular form of um, Clifford matrices, like if you don't know the basis in your local Hilbert space, can you still formulate which state is a stabilizer state and which state has non-zero mana? Uh, it's a good question. I I really at this point can't. Um, so it's something we would like to have. So what I'll argue for you later is that the the in this chosen basis the mana persists to all scales. So in that sense, we do think it's a property of the critical point itself, but we don't have a sort of microscopic independent way of formulating this yet. I think something should exist, but we don't know it yet. What you really need is just this three state structure. And then I think the rest is more or less, is more or less fixed, but, um, but yeah, we don't have that yet. Okay, so let me just describe two other situations to you really quickly. Um, so we can look at say two sites separated by some distance delta x and we look at the magic of that. And uh, what we find there is that the magic goes down with separation in some way. Sorry, I mean the, the mana. Um, it goes down with distance as you see in this black dotted line at the critical point. And then at some point it actually just goes to zero. So it, the state just becomes a stabilizer state or at least has no mana after that point. Um, we can roughly fit this to, that's what this red dashed line is, to uh, power law decay, which then just gets cut off at some point once the argument here is, once the value of this um, expression is less than zero. So we're just taking the minimum of this. Um, so we argue this power law decay is like the conventional power law decay of the pots model. And then it, for a reason I'll explain shortly, it actually just goes to zero at some point. Then um, this is actually because the fixed point state where you take them arbitrarily far apart is non-magical. Okay, but we'll see that in a second. So I can also consider two sites separated by distance delta x, two adjacent sites. And then what we find is that to a very good approximation, it just decays as a power. It doesn't really hit zero ever exactly. It just gets very small. There's a small correction here, but we think this is a sort of finite size effect. And moreover, the, the fit here, this red line, we just put in the exact pots exponent for the lowest correlation function. That's this 4 15 And we get a pretty good agreement with the numerical data. So we think what we're really seeing is just this mana decay is controlled by the decay of correlations. Now let me briefly explain the Mara picture of this so to understand what's going on with these, these different cartoons. So here again is the state I showed you before. Now the blue boxes and the green triangles are viewed as different things, but this is a sort of a detail. Think of the green triangles as like the blue boxes where you had the zeros coming in from before. And for some reason I flipped it upside down just because that's why we drew the pictures, but uh, that's life. 
Okay, so the idea is, well, how can we make an estimate of what is the mana of a subsystem? Um, we want to sort of count basically how many gates are required to produce that subsystem. And then if each gate contributes a certain amount of magic, then we could estimate the magic of a subsystem by counting those gates. There's various ways of trying to count gates. Um, one is to use all the gates that in principle could affect the subregion. That's this blue shaded area up here. Another is to use gates that can only affect that subregion. That's this sort of uh, red shaded region here, light red shaded region. The blue shaded region is sort of the worst case, but it also has a number of gates that diverge with system size, which doesn't seem very sensible. Um, and we argue that, you know, rough, roughly speaking, you should think of these gates that are deep down as kind of having their magic diluted over the whole system or diluted a lot. And so probably they don't contribute very much magic just to a subregion. And so as a simple onsets, we say, can we model the data by just assuming that the only contribution to the magic of a subregion comes from the gates inside this shaded region in here, the red shaded region. That is the gates that just affect the subregion. That's clearly an approximation, but it turns out to work reasonably well to fit the data. So then if we just assume that each blue square and green triangle contributes some amount of magic that we can fix, we can just choose that to fit the data, then you can get something like this. So the black dots are the actual measurements. And the blue line comes from just counting tensors in the tensor network where we choose some convenient values for the magic per box and the magic per triangle. And this gray region is like a 10% variation on top of that, because this is, this is definitely heuristic. We're not claiming this is like a sharp calculation, but it gives you a sense that roughly speaking, the variation with subsystem size can be accounted for by the structure of this network. Now I can give a sharper argument in the case of the correlations. So there, um, because of the property of this network, many of the cancers, tensors cancel out when you're trying to calculate the correlations. And what you end up with, this is a known standard thing in this Mara business, is this kind of like reduced skeleton network where you have um, a sort of one dimensional re re reduced network which connects the two sites you're looking at the correlations of. Again, these little like hats here denote tracing out. And the idea is the following. Okay, if the density matrix rho of delta x were something like rho times rho, which is the infinite delta x limit, plus some power law correction here, then what you would expect is that this minimum between the state rho of delta x and something in the stabilizer set, the minimum distance there would be like this power law component minus a constant, as long as the state row one times row one is non-magical. So here's the picture. Here's row one times row one inside the stabilizer set. That's this gray shaded region. Here's the state row. And you can think of successive applications of the network here, successive layers is like applying some quantum operation, some quantum channel. So every time you do this, you renormalize the state of the two sites they become a little bit less correlated and the state gets pushed further and further, closer and closer to the stabilizer set. And then at some definite point, it enters that stabilizer set, some point before it reaches the actual fixed point. And once it's inside the stabilizer set, the mana has to go to zero. So the picture is the mana can kind of decay roughly, roughly like a power law. And then at some point, it just drops exactly to zero once you enter inside the stabilizer set. And that's exactly what we saw from that little figure from the exact numerical calculation. Um, and it's what's predicted by the, this sort of simple network picture. If the state row one times row one is itself magical, if it has magic just to begin with, even without the correlations, well, then it means that it's outside the stabilizer set. And so you would expect then the magic minus the magic of the final state, row one times row one, would just decay like a power law. And that's what we saw in the two by two case. And indeed, that's the difference between those two cases. The state of a single site is non-magical, it turns out, in this model. And the state of two sites is magical.
And moreover, in the two site case, we can very cleanly see that it was actually the longest, the slowest decaying operator, which gave you the parallel approach. Okay, so the conclusion here is that this MERA network really gives a semi-quantitative picture of the magic structure of this quantum state. And in particular, we find that you need magic at all scales in order to reproduce the observed pattern of correlations and magic from the numerics. And so for that reason, because we have magic at all scales here, we argue that the magic is a property of the infrared theory itself and not just a property of the lattice model. Although, as I said in, in response to Polio's question, um, we don't have a sort of intrinsic field theory of defining that yet. I mean, you could just set up some three state system defining the continuum by like maybe defining some operators or something and try to compute the magic of that. I'm not sure what that would tell you, but we at least argue that from this lattice point of view, if you say had any other set of operators at the lattice scale, which were irrelevant, so you still flow to the CFT fixed point in the infrared, the deep down parts of this network are gonna look the same, and so they're still gonna have mana, and they're still gonna have magic. Okay, so that's, that's, that explains the main, the title of my talk and the main point. Now let me just spend a little bit of the remaining time telling you about why I think this is maybe more interesting than just this simple example. So let me start with an application, or what I'll call an application. So let's consider two cases. One case is the 1D POTS model, which I just told you about, for which I argue that a MERA tensor network indeed well captures the magic structure of that quantum state. Of course, we could also do a variation calculation and actually figure out what the tensors are that give you a good ground state energy. This has actually been done already. And indeed, the MERA seems to capture well that ground state. That's not surprising. And let's compare that to a different case which is the case of a so-called 2D Z2 topological phase. You may know this alternative under the, the, um, by the name of the TORIC code. You can think of it in field theory language as a, as a Z2 topological field theory. And it has, of course, also a condensed matter language, which is this Z2 topological phase, or spin liquid, Z2 spin liquid. These are all roughly the same, or they're all closely related to each other. And I'll just claim without proof that it's also known there in that case for the MERA that a MERA can capture that topological phase exactly. So in particular, the toric code, which is a particular limit of the topological phase, where we turn off the string tension, that has an exact MERA representation in 2D, so a generalization of that 1D picture I showed you, um, where all the gates are C-naught gates. So there's even a known definite set of gates. However, there's a kind of interesting distinction between these two cases. As I just tried to argue for you in some detail, in the POTS case, we need magic at all scales. However, in the Z2 case, we only need magic at short scales. Let me try to explain that. So there is a point in the phase diagram, that's the toric code point, where the phase where the ground state is a stabilizer state. It's an exact stabilizer. So it has no magic and no mana. As I mentioned, it's a, it's a mirror where all the gates are, are controlled knots. Moreover, because any other point in the phase is adiabatically connected to that point by a short depth circuit, or more precisely by a circuit with range that decays faster than any power, this operation, that means that deep inside the MERA in this region up here, which is re representing the deep infrared, we can always flow back to the stabilizer, the stabilizer point where there's no magic. So you may have some magic in the lower levels of the network, which represent the infrared, uh, the UV structure, the details of the particular lattice model. Deep in the infrared, you have no magic. And so in this case, we'd say the state only has short range magic, whereas in the POTS case, you have long range magic. So this is, this is at least a hint that magic can give us something of what we wanted at the start, which is a way to distinguish different kinds of phases from each other using some property that's intrinsic to, to the gates themselves. Because the, the, the POTS CFT and the, 
and the Z2 topological phase have a sort of qualitatively similar MARA structure. They both have long-range entanglement, but only one has long-range magic. And so this is one of the reasons, this is, this is a simple, you know, simple example that we cooked up, um, but it gives you some sense that maybe thinking about states in terms of both their magic and their mana, I mean, and their entanglement can be uh, useful for getting deeper understanding into different kinds of phases of matter. Okay, so let me wrap up here um, with a few comments. So one thing you can, of course, try to do is to study the Q dependence. I considered a particular Q equals three case. Um, it's interesting to ask how it depends on Q. And um, because the POTS model for Q uh, bigger than three is first order in 1D, you can just try to use a mean field theory. Actually, mean field theory predicts that it's first order even at Q equals three, but that's not right physically but we think that mean field theory is at least qualitatively right for higher Q. And what the mean field theory predicts, especially at large Q, is that the transition is strongly first order, and more the mana is never very close to maximal. It's actually always order one. Essentially because you go just from being a most, more or less all X state to a more or less all Z state um, in a sudden way without ever sort of mixing the two very much. And so that's interesting, one interesting example, but I think it's interesting in particular to study other kinds of large and type situations and to see if we can um, find a uh, you know, richer variety of phenomena. Maybe, maybe a situation where there's still a conformal field theory describing the low energy physics, but we also have a large N or large Q. And this is sort of a, a, as a hope to go towards things like ADS CFT. So in particular, if we're really thinking about ADS-CFT or about field theories, we want some more continuum-friendly measures. And we also would like to see if this magic can distinguish us between, say, sparse spectrum models versus the opposite extreme of like a symmetric orbifold. If you think about just orbifolding a bunch of POTS models, say, which I'm not claiming is holographic, but if you just imagine doing that, you would expect the magic to be sort of extensive with a number of copies but maybe with the sparse spectrum somehow there's, there's less magic. Okay. This could make contact eventually with the ADS CFT conjectures having to do with stabilizer states being a good um, cartoon of the entanglement structure because if we could say in some robust continuum friendly sense that the, the entanglement was sort of stabilizer like or not, we might be able to say something, say something concrete about these different, these different ideas. Um, more generally, I, I would just question say, about ADS yeah. uh, CFT one. Please. Um, um, so, uh, if you consider two-dimensional rational conformal field theories with some yes. given central charge, uh, the, the Hilbert space of that theory is very special, and it's basic. Well, it's topological, so it's just essentially associated to a genus G surface. Um, uh, can you make sense of uh, these uh, 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 mana and mera states in this Hilbert space in this uh, topological context? Um, potentially. So, I mean, I haven't thought about it at all, really, but we have, uh, there's maybe a re related so set of one ideas. Reason, one reason for asking this is because uh, this uh, 2D, these 2D RCFTs are very closely related to fault tolerant uh, quantum computation, in particular, uh, for models of topological comp uh, quantum computation um, built on yeah. non-Euclidean anions. So yeah, so, so we actually did have a paper a, a while back where we studied churn simons theories. And I, we looked at- My uh, mentor, uh, Greg, told me about that. So I did yeah. look at- Yeah, so, so there we, we found, for example, for abelian churn simons versus uh -huh. abelian U1 churn simons, a set of states you could prepare were stabilizer states. So uh, those case, would be non-magical. Uh, so in this case, the Hilbert space was for a genus one surface? Uh, yeah, well, you, you could do anything, but we focused on genus one. Okay. And we, we asked what kinds of states you could prepare by Euclidean path integral mm -hmm. with some, some, some arbitrary three manifold connecting a bunch of torus boundaries. Right. Or and for, for U1 turn Simons, we found that it's stabilizer, at least, okay, we, there was some technical condition on the level, but let's ignore that. Mm -hmm. But then for certain kind of non-abelian states where you could say, where you could show the mapping class group was, was mm -hmm. 
sufficiently rich, yeah, um, then you could get any state, or at least you could you could have a dense set of states. That's so, yeah. I think there is hope to talk about magic and mana in those contexts, but we have not tried that yet. Great. Okay, we can discuss that. There. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Also, uh, as far I mean, about your first comment, so you're looking at these cyclotomic fields of uh, prime degree, basically. Yes. Uh, I mean, these fields generated by Q. Uh, and the main difference amongst them, you already pointed out that uh, if either Q is a uh, prime or not, or if it's even or odd, yeah. and that basically shows up in the Galois group of uh, the cyclotomic field. But the large Q limit, is there any difference? I mean, uh, uh, what do you expect to see in the large Q limit? Because the behavior of the cyclotomic fields is uh, not really changing. Yeah, I, I I don't I don't necessarily expect sort of as long as you restrict to say odd prime q, I don't think that the field structure is changing in any really important sense. But I think the behavior of the model is changing, the Hamiltonian itself. Yeah, because gates are changing. I mean, the 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 matrices change because q. Yeah, is so with, so yeah. somehow like it becomes unfavorable to sort of have a mixture of x and z in. And you always just want to be either all X or all Z, more or less. Oh, okay. But that's yeah, a, that's sort of a detailed statement about the Hamiltonian. So I, I don't know if that there's like other kinds of models where that's not the case. I see. Okay. So in this case, because Q was particularly showing up in your quantum gates, you obviously uh, have some effect as Q goes to infinity. Or yeah. Okay. It's really, I think, the Hamiltonian, like the, particular, the particular interactions, which which are dominating this physics here. Okay. Okay. So yeah, just to mention these last two points, um, you know, I, this is a fun subject. There's like a lot of silly names. Um, people who like fantasy novels clearly have been playing a role here. Um, so it's enjoyable to think about, and it's a new topic. And I think you know one of the things we need. To me, it seems like it's worth a little bit of time just to sort of collect data and see if we can learn something about how this magic and mana behave in different contexts, see if there's anything interesting there. So that's one of the things we're doing right now, just exploring a few uh, low hanging fruits and seeing if there's anything interesting. Um, one very concrete thing that which will come out of this is, is information about simulation calls on one of computers. So of course, simulating field theory, simulating lattice models, those are all very interesting. And these computations of magic and mana can help us understand which things are easy and which things are hard, say in the context of some fault tolerance scheme. Okay, so there is a practical output of this work no matter what, um, which is coming from the quantum simulation point of view. So then I'll just wrap up with a couple of opinions. Um, I first gave this talk at a conference where I was supposed to share provocative opinions on complexity. So here's a few provocative opinions, hopefully provocative opinions. Um, I think that this complexity geometry duality and tensor network geometry dualities in ABS-CFT are sort of unreasonably successful. They work better than you might have thought, and they give a lot of good intuition. And building on that, there's sort of a lot of toy models that have been used to study complexity. But I think a lot of the current understanding does not distinguish between, say, chaotic Ising model and holographic field theory, as I sort of indicated before. Magic was our attempt, one attempt to start thinking about these differences. Um, but even apart from that, I think a lot of very basic issues remain. For example, I said that you expect the complexity to grow linearly with entropy in this time dependence situation. So for a large n gauge theory, that might be proportional to n squared. But actually, if you look at the quantum simulation literature, I don't think there is currently a quantum algorithm known which can achieve that, that complexity cost. I'm not saying it's impossible to simulate them. It just takes a higher order, a higher power of n per time step to do the Hamiltonian simulation. So I think there's very basic algorithmic issues that we still don't understand from the simulation point of view. And that might indicate that there's something deep and interesting still to learn about the way complexity plays out in even these holographic situations and, and many body physics more generally. So I think it's an interesting time to think about this subject. And I think that there's a lot of unexplored tools and ideas that we can bring to bear, which, which 
might give us some interesting new insights. And so with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Yeah, it's a, uh, um, thank you to uh, uh, Brian for giving uh, such a nice talk. And uh, now people can ask questions uh, because there is a discussion session, so you can continue the discussion. Yeah, so like whoever want to ask question, please ask. May I uh, ask the following question? Yeah. So uh, j uh, first, uh, a theoretical question. Is it true that if uh, dimension of the local Hilbert space is equal to two, so we're talking about qubits, is it, is it correct that all states are stabilizer states? No, no, not correct. You mentioned that uh, Q equal two is weird. So that's why you considered Q equal three. So could you please uh, maybe explain mathematically what's going on there and maybe comment uh, Q equal two means that central charge is like one half. So do you think there might be a difference between uh, C larger than one models and minimal models? So sort of like minimal models are not magical and non-minimal models are magical. Um, well, so let me, so first the issue about two versus three. So the important thing is whether two inverse exists in the field. And when it's mod two, it does not exist. And when it's mod three, it does. So for example, um, two is the inverse of two mod three. And so whenever, whenever Q is odd and prime, then like Q plus one over two is an integer and it serves as an inverse. So basically when you have Clifford, when you have qubits, you need to put not an integer power of omega here, but, but I, which is the square root of omega. And that extra I just complicates your life a lot. So you can have, for example, stabilizer states with negative Wigner function. So it's just, you, magic still makes sense. You can still have stabilizers. Those are not all of the states, but it's just a little bit more elaborate of a structure. There's more details that matter. So it's just simpler in the three state case. As for your question about rational versus, or like minimal model versus non-minimal models. Well, I mean, I guess POS is still minimal. So, so and it is magical in this sense. So I, I think, I, I certainly can imagine that minimal models are different than non-minimal models. I mean, I know we know many ways that's true, but um, I think I don't see a clear distinction here. Like if I looked at say even the Ising critical point, although I can't calculate the mana for that because it has two states per site in the simplest, um, the simplest lattice model, we do know because it's dual to these free fermions and because we know an exact or quasi exact Mara for that, we can see that you need T gates even for that case. So it is magical. It's just, we can't characterize it with this man in the same way. Thanks. I have a, a question about the same slide here and yeah. they're very basic because, uh, well, because I don't know much. Uh, so number one, this Clifford group that you talk about, this is a, uh, a universal gate set. That it's is not the, universal. It is or it is not? It is, it is not universal. I see. Okay. So, so it is a discrete group. Yeah. Which is a not, not a universal group. I mean, it's, it's discrete. So, well, it's not universal. The set of state ledger states are not the set of all states. So you know, in so, fact, it's so, actually classically simulable. You can follow the dynamics of this Clifford, these Clifford gates. It turns out to be equivalent to some kind of like symplectic phase space dynamics of discrete type. So what you need is to add one of these non-Clifford gates, like what I put in the red box here, so-called T gate. Mm -hmm. And then Clifford plus this T gate can generate you everything, or at least is a dense set of all. That's okay, good. So that was my definition for universal. So the Clifford itself is not, but uh, you need to put in P. And uh, again, as a mathematician, P is a matrix. It shouldn't be any different than uh, any other matrix. So what does difficult mean? Yeah, th this, this, you shouldn't take this precise T like so seriously. Like any rotation by an angle, it's not um, this particular power of, you know, it's not this root of, not unit, root of unity. Yeah, okay. 
Okay, so um, as soon as you have to join another root of unity, that's where difficult. But is this difficulty physical actually in implementing the uh, gates in some model or? Yeah, so, so yeah, it can have a precise physical origin. So for example, I don't know how much this will mean to you, but let me try anyways. So, so like one possibility for implementing a fault tolerant computer would be to use a topological scheme based on Myron and qubits. Mm -hmm. And then like what you can do is you can like braid these Myron and qubits around each other and mm -hmm. that implements certain set of gates. It turns out those gates are Clifford gates. So there is a kind of like topological discrete character to it, which is why, you know, say certain powers like certain angles are kind of allowed because they have a discrete topological character like that. They square or they cube to one. You know, okay. these, these space. So, so like when you have an arbitrary rotation, that's hard to do in this sort of topological setting. Yeah. And so it, it, there is, there can be a real physics reason why like the Cliffords are easy and something else is hard because you need to do some non-protected non-topological operation to generate an arbitrary rotation, which is what you need to, make arbitrary states that's really and cool so, so wait so uh, what are the particles that uh, actually when you braid them around each other they give you the clifford group they're uh Majorana. these are Majorana anions oh so the anions do the job here you don't need yeah them on so the this this would correspond to essentially you're having two states now so it's the q equals two case mm -hmm. and um the braiding, so, so a pair of, of anions will have a two-level system, mm -hmm. corresponding to whether there's a fermion there or not, a pair of my, a pair of these Majorana fermions. And, um, and yeah, so you have, say, four of them, you have a four-level space, and you by braiding them, you can in, implement some gates in that four-level space. And it turns out those gates are Clifford's. Ooh, that's and so then there was a there was this this notion of magic came from that actually or from a related notion where what you could do is if you had some source of extra kind of states called magic states, then by doing gate based teleportation, or uh, you know, you you can implement gates by teleportation, then you could sort of use this magic state as a resource to inject like non Clifford angles into your circuit. And so what you need is kind of a source of these states, and that would be like a, a fuel for your quantum computing fire, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And what, what this was all about was like, how do you get these states? Or if you have imperfect versions of these states, can you distill them to produce nice versions? It turns out you can do that using only Cliffords for certain okay. special values of, for certain special states. And that's kind of where this T-gate came from. I see. But, uh, but that, 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 yeah, so. So um, once you complete uh, the Clifford group with the T-gate to make it a universal gate set, uh, then you can apply the solovic kataev theorem. And that basically tells you that you can, well, if you can approximate any uh, thing in your SU2 to the D by a word of length L, where L is basically log to the C1 over epsilon. I mean, the main point is about this C. And that depends on the choice of your gate set. And one can bring the C down to one, which are called golden gates. So is this, does this generate a, a golden gate set? Or do you know what the that. constant T is in uh, the solovic kataev theorem if you apply it to this gate set? Yeah, I, I, I just don't know the answer to that, sorry. Okay, I, I mean, I think it is big. I forget all the examples. There are very few examples of these golden gates and they're important in number theory or uh, not important, but no, that's somewhere where number theory has made some contribution. Hmm. But it will be really nice to see these uh, golden gates predicted by number theory show up in uh, actual physical models. <laughs> yeah, that would be cool. But, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think here, you know, if I can just comment, I think this T gate is not specifically important. I mean, the, the Cliffords are important. The gate you use to go beyond them is maybe not so important for my story. Mm -hmm. But but there is still a lot of thought to be put in about what part of this is sort of universal or independent or general, and what part of it really depends on the details. Right, the details of the team.
Right. Yeah. Okay. So in some, and uh, I had a question about the previous slide. I've seen this slide and I've never understood it. So now I will just ask. Uh, it's this one? Uh, no, it was about uh, tensor networks and filling up the middle, the one before this. So, I mean, it's a question that is related to the one I already asked. So this wormhole network, if one wants to think, it's basically a bunch of um, uh, quantum gates uh, that you've thrown in the middle. Yeah. And again, the quantum gates that you've thrown in are random. There's That's not determined by the black hole geometry or anything. So the circuit that you end up with is uh, completely random. It's, it's determined by the Hamiltonian. Yeah, okay, the same answer. Okay. So the, okay. the idea would be that you, you evolve with the Hamiltonian, which means you act with unitaries at this outer edge here. Right. And the, the idea that we had in this paper, the one I'm referencing here in the complex equals action paper, is that, well, what you should do is this sort of UV time evolution, the short distance time evolution, you can renormalize by passing through the circuit in some sense. Mm -hmm. And then what are the outputs at the sort of inner part here is a kind of renormalized evolution, mm -hmm. which is just the Hamiltonian, but renormalized down to the scale of this like thermal excitations here. So these gates would still be determined by the Hamiltonian itself, but I just see. some renormalized version of it. I see, it does, okay. So in particular, like every layer would be the same you would expect or, or yeah. And you're just laying yeah, down the same case okay. over and over and well, over. That's very nice. So the wormhole network is essentially the unitary time evolution of your hammer. Correct, yeah. That's what is going on. But uh, usually, so why, so what is the Hilbert space in this theory? It's basically some two to the D space. It's Yeah, we, you know, let's say we have some like microscopic, Hilbert space on the edges. Uh -huh. And then we can renormalize that down to some kind of low energy Hilbert space, which lives kind of here, um, uh -huh. which is wh where the number of, the, the dimension is like E to the entropy. Okay. So it's like, if you like compressing the state here into some like active or important degrees of freedom at this scale. So, I mean, if you think about this in terms of uh, quantum computation or quantum information, what is important is how many gates you throw in. Does that only depend on the time of the evolution? Um, yeah, roughly we think like this RG, what I call the RG part, the outer part is just fixed by the state itself mm -hmm. um, at time zero. And then as time evolves, yeah, you just kind of add to this wormhole part and that's essentially fixed by how many gates are there is fixed by the time and the number of degrees of freedom at this low energy scale here. I see. So it's just the, basically the time times the computational rate times the number of degrees of freedom. I see. Cool. I would okay. be... So uh, like you have more questions? I can finish with the last one. It, it would be nice to see this thing in a Euclidean uh, uh, ADS3 wormhole where on the boundaries you really have a two-dimensional manifold with the rational conformal field theory living on it. And uh, it, it, the wormhole is essentially... Yeah, I mean, I, I, it would be nice to see some kind of more concrete example, I, I agree. The only... A, a, there's a problem with the case of rational CFT, which is that they're not chaotic. So we don't actually expect the complexity to grow with time forever or for a very long time. Like here, the idea is this wormhole would actually grow until like, it's like exponentially long, mm -hmm. exponential in system size. Whereas for like for a free fermion CFT, say, I mean, I know that's a, that's a simple case, but like there, you know, you have exact recurrences after some, amount of time related to the system size, like linear and system size. So you would, so for these rational models, you could see like some amount of complexity growth, I think, but then eventually it would, it would short circuit again. And mm -hmm. you, the complexity would not keep growing because it's has too many, it's too, it's too rational, I guess. It's too like uh, commensurate to kind of move around forever in Hilbert space. Yeah, it's is this related to the air infest uh, time or the scrambling time? 
Yeah, so there is really no scrambling in this model. And so somehow, or at least not the strongest kind of scrambling. And so, yeah, it should really have like Poincaré recurrences after a relatively exactly. short time. Yeah, okay, good, 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 okay. Okay, thank you so much. I mean, this yeah. can go on forever, so. My pleasure. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, so uh, thank you, Bran, for giving such a nice talk, which will be helpful for every of us because uh, like uh, it was really nice talk and I hope the discussions also help a lot of people uh, to understand this uh, framework more. If you have more questions, you can contact Brian directly and ask whatever you want. And uh, thank you for your time, Brian, and uh, support. Our next talk will be given by Goyf Pennington from Stanford on uh, Monday. Great. Thanks okay. a lot, everybody. See you. Have a good day. Uh, thank you for organizing, Shanti. Thank you. Everybody is clapping. <laughs>